Hi, uh, my name is Art Bergeron. Welcome to this installment in the series of uh, seminars that I am doing virtually during these COVID times. Usually these seminars I'd be doing uh, at your local senior center or library. Um, but until COVID is over, which we're hoping is not going to be too far into the future, uh, I've agreed with the local cable folks that I would, I would record these uh, and do them virtually. Um, and so this month's presentation, this, the, for um, February, uh, is, folk, is about focusing on planning to stay home. Um, I know that, as you know, I often talk about my friends Frank and Mary and their kids Peter, Paul and Mary Jr. And, and their goal in life is very simple. Um, they want to live in their house until they die. They want to be buried in the backyard. Um, and that's like a lot of people's goal. But the question is exactly how they're going to accomplish that, right? They really don't want to be moving out of town. They'd rather not be moving in with their kids or into assisted living. Now, I want to emphasize that there may come a time for Frank and Mary where they need to do that. You know, you, you, you want to stay at home as long as it's safe to stay at home, you know, but, but if it's just not safe anymore, well, then you need to try to figure out some kind of accommodation. So one of the real questions that Frank and Mary need to face as their home ages is how they can make sure that that home stay or becomes uh, as safe as possible and remains as affordable as possible as they get older. Because as, as the house ages, things you know, need repair. And, and the, that's a one in, in just the, in terms of the basic house. And then in addition to that, um, there are other changes they may want to make. Also, um, they want to make sure that the house is safe because they want to make sure that nobody ever wants to end up in a nursing home. Um, their goal is to stay at home, but their goal also is to never go to a nursing home. So who needs to be in a house where there is a, a reasonable possibility that you might fall, that you might break a hip, and all of a sudden you've got these alternatives that are just really the alternatives that you never ever wanted to have happen to you. Um, you also want to make sure, though, that in addition to the home being safe, that you have provided for yourselves so that if one of you gets older um, and really needs help at home, you're going to have some assistance at home. So we're going to, but but you know, hoping for these things is not a plan. That's what I really try to focus with with people. I know so often people will say, "Yes, I'm like Frank and Mary. I want to stay at home until I die. I want to be buried in the backyard." And I'm hoping it all works out. Well, you know, that's, that, you can do it that way, but you've got an alternative, which is to really kind of think it out better. So um, I'm assuming here that Frank and Mary have uh, assets that are pretty traditional, that they have a house that's worth about $400,000, that they have savings of about $200,000, and that Frank has an IRA of about $200,000. So they have total assets of about $800,000. Um, these, these, these are, are Pretty, uh, I realize in your community these n numbers may vary, especially as, as many folks know, I do work in Martha's Vineyard in Nantucket. Uh, the house number may be way off in Martha's Vineyard in Nantucket and you need to be kind of like um, adjusting for that accordingly. But we're going to assume in these cases that, that Frank's base income is only his Social Security of $2,000 a month and that Mary's base income is her Social Security, half of Frank's, $1,000 a month. Um, and so the question is how you deal with these planning goals. How do you make the house safe? How do you make the house safe so that you're not going to fall down, so that the chances of it are much lower? Um, how do you make the house affordable? How do you make it affordable into the future, uh, assuming that issues may happen with the house? The house is going to get old just like you are. And the question is how do you make sure that you, you've budgeted to replace the things that might need replacing? And finally, how do you make sure that you've got enough funds put aside for home care? And I think that's, a, that's a, another issue that's just really, really important. So we're going to talk about each of those. First, how do you figure out is the house safe? And not just safe for you right now, um, because that is certainly important, but how could it be made safe for you uh, as you got more frail? In this case, Frank and Mary are 70 and they're still pretty in pretty good shape. But you know, we all age and with age inevitably comes frailty. So the way to do that really is to have somebody come to your home and talk to you about that. Somebody who's in 
construction, but also understands these issues with falls. Now, what I'm, I'm just mentioning one of the people that in the, in the, in the area where I live, in uh, the boroughs, um, is this woman who is Carol D. Rienzo, who lives in North Bro, and she's just terrific, and that's what they do. She and her husband, he, he's, a, um, he's a, a, um, uh, a contractor, and she's a nurse. And she, they could help you kind of figure out the kinds of things that you might want to do to adapt your home to make sure that that works. But there are a number of folks in your area who could also talk to you about these things. The point is you need to reach out, maybe reach out to your senior center, reach out to folks in the community to try to figure out who can really tell you how to make your house more safe. Whether it, it, it and once again, considering how you are feeling right now, but just kind of anticipating how you might need to be adjusting your home in the future. Um, now, Carol or whoever you talk to is gonna to talk to you about a whole set of things that you could do to modify your home. Once again, whether you need them now or whether you wanna budget for them in case you need them into the future, right? I mean, whenever we think about these adjustments, we always think about simply the ramp that outside. But you know, there are adjustments that can be made inside. There are adjustments to make sure that you can get up to the second floor. Uh, if you have a two floor house, which most of us live in is a two floor house. One of the interesting um, things that has, has technology has really improved over time is the ability to actually install an elevator in your home. Elevator costs, I remember 10 or 15 years ago when I would do presentation like this, ele home elevator costs were $100,000 or more. Now those elevator costs have gone down to about 40000 certainly not nothing, right? But not what you would have anticipated would be the cost of making sure that you can always use your second floor because in the standard home that, that, that many of us live in, you've got living space on the first floor, you've got bedrooms on the second floor. People often dread this, this notion of having to, to rearrange the first floor uh, in order to live on the first floor. Well, maybe the alter there is an alternative and you can compare the prices of whether you wanna do that or actually have an elevator to the second floor. But there are a bunch of other things. The lighting in the house is really crucial to making sure that you're safe in the house. Having grab bars. Where do most people fall in the bathroom, right? And, and, and grab bars, one of the things that you'll find is that when you think about grab bars, you think about, ooh, grab bars, you know, like the hospital and those big grab bars. There are, there are a number of, 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 of in archi I wanna say architecturally designed, but interior designed grab bars that are not only safe, but actually blend in. So there are a lot of modifications that you can do to the home to just make it more safe. And once again, it, it takes somebody in the field who is seeing the kind of things that are available for modifications to really help you figure that out. Now, once you've done that, you, you know, you wanna sit down and figure out and just estimate what would be the cost of all of these things? What would be the cost of the improvements that you um, would wanna make right now because of your health to just make the house safer right now? And then what are the costs in the back of your mind that you would say, well, you know, I really don't need those right now, right? Maybe I'd wanna put them in now, but not necessarily because of course, right now, if you're still in fairly good health, you don't know that the direction that your health might take. You don't know whether you're gonna have issues with your knees or whether you're gonna have issues with balance or whether you're gonna have issues with memory um, which, or with, or which might affect the kinds of improvements that you want. But you can know what kinds of things you would need if you had any of those problems. So you wanna be kind of figuring out, you wanna look at the cost, look at the cost of a chairlift or an elevator or grab bars all through the house or a ramp. Uh, but then also look at, apart from that, what are the basic systems in your house that you might just need to get fixed? The roof. You know, everybody's gonna at some point need a new roof, right? The furnace, once again, fur the trouble with furnaces is either they're good or they're not. And when they're not, you gotta get them fixed. So you may not be wanting to replace that furnace right now, but you need to know that there's enough money in the bank to do that work. The hot water heater, exactly the same thing. And then just kind of miscellaneous repairs. You don't know if you get termites, if you get any number of things, 
where are you going to find the money in order to take care of all of those things, right? So you need to kind of figure out a basic estimate. Now, once again, in this case, I'm estimating that the total cost of those things is $100,000. So that's the first piece. How do you make sure that you can always adjust the house to keep it safe, no matter kind of what your condition is? Second question is, if you, a big piece of being able to stay home is not only ha making sure the house is safe, but making sure that if there are things that you just can't do anymore, right? Or that you have, I shouldn't say things you can't do, things you have trouble doing, things that are unsafe to do, unless there's somebody else that's there. The question then is, how do you, how do you pay for that kind of home care? And how do you figure out how much that home care might be? So, once again, it is easy to assume, well, if I really need home care, you know, the kids are going to pitch in. Now, and of course, you, you, Frank and Mary are going to take care of each other, except I have a lot of these kinds of cases where one of the spouses is getting increasingly disabled, the other spouse is taking, or the healthy spouse, quote unquote, is taking care of them until the healthy spouse falls down or the healthy spouse has a heart attack from picking up the spouse that had been having problems and was falling down. So, so you, you don't want to assume that as you both get older, if you're Frank and Mary, that as one of you gets more frail, the other one's still going to be healthy. That's not a great assumption, right? It might work out, but maybe not. Or inevitably folks will say, oh, my kids will take care of this. You know, my kids are great and, and that's terrific. But I'll tell you, so I have three kids and they are terrific and they would do what they can, except one lives in Washington, D.C. and has a family of her own. My second daughter lives in Austin, Texas, and our son lives in Colorado Springs. And, and it is kind of unfair to think that if there were, if, as you were getting older, that they would need, the, your children would really need to be rearranging their lives in a, in a, and it could be in a really serious way in order to bring them home in order to have them come home and help you out. So once again, hope is not a plan. So you need to think about, you know, if you needed help, who the people are who are around who could help you so that you continue to live. Because if you're, if you're Frank and Mary, you really like your house and you want to be in your house. And, and, and especially if later in your life you're suffering memory issues, the, 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 one of the things that you don't want to do as your memory is getting worse is move out of your house because you know where everything is. You know where the bathroom is. You know where the salt and pepper is. You know? So you really want to figure out how to be able to stay in that house. So you want, to be kind of, you want to be trying to estimate the cost of home care in that case, right? Home care that you're going to need to pay for. And, and don't assume that you necessarily want to just, you know, the, the lady down the street's going to help you out, you know, oh, but you can slip her a few dollars under the table. You want to make sure that there is home care that is there that you can rely on um, and, and, that, and where folks are trained and where folks are trained. So thinking about, let's take a few minutes thinking about home care. So forget about 24-7 care, just it, it, it is it, it is inc extremely expensive. So there's the math. 24-7 um, care. 24-7 means care every hour of every day for a year. There are um, 8,760 hours in a year. Um, at the cost of home care right now, which is about $25 per hour, that's $219,000 per year. That's not going to work out, right? So, so the, the likelihood that that's just really, really extreme. On the other hand, it may be reasonable to say that you can provide for home care that is enough to supplement the care that Frank may be providing for, for uh, that Frank may be providing for Mary, or maybe maybe Mary is providing for Frank, or that their kids are providing for them. When I think about that, you, when you think about the care that you need, not to be at the every moment of the day, but care with dressing. Maybe you're having trouble, right? Because they're getting stiff and it's hard. Toileting, taking a shower, right? Um, maybe you know you you know you can take a shower, but what are the chances that you're going to fall down if you're in that shower if there isn't somebody that's there? Or or just meal meals prep, 
right? Do you really want to be making all those meals, you know, as you get more frail? Or don't you want to be planning that there's somebody else who's taking care of that for you? Well, if you factor all of those things in, you're probably going to find that you need care of about four hours per day. Four hours per day, and you can remain at home even if you're pretty frail, right? Four hours a day times those $25 times 365 days in a year is $36,500. Now, assume that you want to be safe in your home for five years, that the period of your frailty where you're still going to be able to be at home without needing 24-7 care is five years. All of that means that you need to have about $182,500 in order to, if, if that's your plan. So, what's the cost of staying at home? Not right now, but into the future. $100,000 for those home repairs, $182,500 for the, uh, for the uh, home, possible home care, total $282,500. So what are the resources that you're going to have for that rainy day? That's $282,500. Now in this case, you may recall, Frank and Mary actually, in addition to their home, have other assets of about $400,000, right? You may or may not fit into that category, but in any event, you want to know that there's enough money there that you can find that $282,500 when you need it. You don't need it now, but when you need it. There are two uh, obvious possibilities as far as the house is concerned. One is the traditional HELOC, the home equity line of credit. The second is the reverse mortgage. Let me talk to you about both. The, he the typical home equity line of credit will give you uh, a line of credit for about 75% of the value of your property, which in this case uh, would be 75% of $400,000, which would be about $300,000. The, the closing costs are typically low on these, as opposed to uh, first mortgage costs, there'd be about $1,000. And in a HELOC, this is a line of credit, so it's like a big credit card, and you don't pay any interest until you've borrowed on the credit card. So you can set this HELOC up and not withdraw any of the money until you need it. Um, once you've started withdrawing, interest will accrue on the amount that you've withdrawn, but typically you're paying interest only on HELOC loans up to a particular period of time, but there is a limit to how long they last. Typically, that, that piece of the HELOC lasts for about 10 years, and from then on in, the HELOC turns into a regular self-amortizing mortgage, and you need to start making significant um, principal payments. Um, typically, there is, there is not an income requirement in, in order to uh, qualify, but this is going to vary by bank. Um, one key to thinking about this is that to qualify for one of these, you have to stay as the homeowner. You can't be deeding out an interest in your property to anybody else in order to qualify and, and still qualify for one of these. Um, this is really important if you're also doing planning that is trying to protect your home against the possibility that you might need mass health in the future because you're in a nursing home or need a lot of care at home. Um, in that case, if you're trying to protect your home, the way to protect it is to deed out an interest in your home, probably a remainder interest, keep a life estate. You've heard me talk about these things before and wait five years. You can't do that in the case of the HELOC. Finally, the HELOC is typically due well, at the end of the mortgage period or if you sell the property or at death. A second alternative is the reverse mortgage. Um, this is an alternative that I always recommend that people think about. You don't necessarily want to do it, but you want to think about it, right? because the reverse mortgage may, for you, be a better alternative to that HELOC. The reverse mortgage. So, if, you, if Frank and Mary had this $400,000 house and were 70 years old, the amount that they would get in an available line of credit through the reverse mortgage would be about $218,000. Uh, le less, than, less than the HELOC, except this number goes up every year. If Frank and Mary were, were 80 years old, this percentage would be, um, uh, or the amount that they'd be able to get would be closer to $300,000. Um, the available line of credit from the HELOC increases every year. So every year that you don't use, excuse me, from the reverse mortgage, every year you don't use the reverse mortgage, the amount that you can borrow goes up by around, by between, I think between 25 and 5% varies depending on the, the uh, reverse mortgage. There's a high closing cost on these. Uh, the closing cost is, tip is now, uh, for a house of this size, about $16,000. Um, the reason for that is that what you're doing when you're closing is you're, pre you're, you're now required to prepay 
the, 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 the home, the, the, the mortgage insurance premium that the government requires that you, that you basically buy whenever you're doing one of these. Because in the event that you fail to pay on your reverse mortgage, the federal government reimburses the bank um, um, for, for any amount that the bank it, that is doing this might lose, right? So you're basically paying that insurance premium. But that typically um, gets simply added into the mortgage proceeds. So, so you, if, you, if you're going to be borrowing $218,000, you would simply say, okay, $16,000 of that um, is going to be deducted from the $218,000 that I could have pulled out. The remainder I'm not going to pull out. The only interest that is accruing every month is interest on that $16,000, right? And there are no monthly payments. The interest that accrues on these mortgage, mortgages simply piles up over time. It's a very, very small amount that piles up over time and is due upon the sale of the property or um, in, the, in the case of a reverse mortgage within one year after you die. So there are no monthly payments. That's one of the real benefits of these compared to um, um, the HELOC. Uh, on, you, if you have a HELOC, you start using your line of credit and you're instantly stuck with these monthly payments. If you're Frank and Mary and you're worried that in the long run on your fixed income, you're going to have trouble adding to your fixed cost another monthly payment, then the reverse mortgage is a really handy um, mechanism to take care of that. And once again, the reverse mortgage is due on sale or one year from the date of death. But the thing to remember about the reverse mortgage, this is, an, this is a real benefit of the reverse mortgage is that it, the reverse mortgage is not due if you transfer an interest in your property to somebody else, as long as you keep an interest in the property. So for example, if you're doing the kind of mass health related planning that I was talking to, and you, uh, talking about, and you want to transfer an interest in your property, um, a remainder interest in your house to your kids or to an irrevocable trust, and start that five-year clock running to make sure that the house will be safe if you later need to qualify for mass health. That transfer does not violate the terms of the reverse mortgage. So you can get that reverse mortgage in place and still have this ability to do this kind of mass health related planning. Finally, there's something called the Home Modification Loan Program. Uh, this is available statewide. Uh, it, many, many people aren't aware of this. Uh, this program is only available to folks who have got an, exi an existing disability, who've got existing problems um, moving around at home which, for which the, Im the improvements being made to the home uh, will compensate. But, but if you are in that situation, uh, this program would allow you to borrow for up, up to $50,000 for modifications to deal with that disability. Um, there is no interest, you, you would be paying no interest the loan that you, that in return for that loan, you are going to give the, uh, the, um, the, the folks who are doing this program a mortgage, but that mortgage can be a second mortgage. It doesn't have to be a first mortgage. Um, the, the, there, are, there are no payments that are due um, unless you, or while you're, there are no payments that are due. Um, the maximum income of folks to be available for this program is extremely high. For Frank and Mary in 2019, they could qualify for this loan as long as their income was less than $189,000 a year. So you can definitely qualify. And once, but once again, uh, in, with this program, uh, the mortgage is going to be due on sale or transfer of the property. So it's a handy extra device that you might want to, that you, you should know that you can use. Finally, I want to talk a little bit about paying for home care. Um, as we talked about as we were going along, the, pos the projected cost that we have of home care here was about $182,500. Now that's, that's a lot of money. But I want you to kind of think about the ways in which you can deal with those costs. Um, first, um, if, 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 if Frank or Mary need that kind of home care because they can demonstrate that they need either assistance with two of the activities of daily living, and I named some of them, eating, bathing, dressing, toileting, or transfer, transferring, or they can show that they need the home care assistance um, because they've got memory issues, and so it is unsafe for them to be home alone. 
then the, the payments that are being made to the home care providers, whether they're to an agency or even to an individual, are tax deductible, are tax deductible. The reason why that's real, they, that, that could be significant to Frank and Mary in two ways. One, remember Frank has uh, $200,000 in an IRA. So if Frank ends up being incapacitated or Mary ends up being incapacitated, and, they, and in order to pay for the home care, they use, they pull out some of Frank's money to pay for the home care for either Frank or Mary, those payments are going to be tax deductible, which means that, that as opposed to your, the typical scenario where you pull out money from an IRA or a 401k, and now all of a sudden you've generated a big tax bill, in this case, you're probably not going to generate any tax bill at all. A second uh, alternative way of dealing with that issue uh, would be for if Frank and Mary aren't, don't have that IRA, but simply have, have cash, if they give that cash to one of their children, Peter, Paul, or Mary, uh, Mary Jr., and then, Mary, and then one of them starts using that money to pay for their home care at home, if the total amount of that home care is substantial, if it's, if it's more than half of the total expenses of the, of the parent that they're dealing with, then that, those payments could end up being a medical deduction for the children, for the children. So for more on that, you may want to talk to your, uh, your, um, your, finan your financial advisor, your accountant, uh, or your attorney. Finally, um, there may be other ways to pay for that for for all of that care and I'm we're going to go into more detail on that in, on these other ways in other presentations um, there is a state funded program referred to as uh, ecop um, which which will through which you you can obtain uh, home care coverage of typically no more than six hours per week so it's limited and there is a small copay that you'll have to pay based on income but the point is there are no asset requirements regarding that program. Second, there is long-term care insurance. And I think we're going to talk a little bit more about long-term care insurance in a later program. Um, but if you buy long-term care insurance, remember we were anticipating that, you, that, you, that Frank and Mary would not need more than five hours per, of, of care per day, which would cost about $125 per day. If you buy a policy, if Frank and Mary bought a home uh, long-term care insurance policy, that paid for up to $125 a day in home care and also had a provision that said that if they were in the nursing home, it would pay for nursing home care. And if that policy ran, was, was going to provide for payments for at least two years, then A, Frank and Mary would have this backup care to take care of themselves. B, if they ever needed to qualify for mass health because they had that policy, as long as the policy was still in effect when they were trying to qualify for mass health, their home would no longer be a, would not be a countable asset and also would not be lienable following their death. Um, finally, there's the Massachusetts Frail Elder Waiver Program, which we will also talk about in a later program. Uh, if Frank and Mary qualified for mass health, there would be a program that would be available that could give them even more care while they were at home. So, in summary. If you're th Frank and Mary and you're thinking about your future and you want to stay at home, make a budget, figure out how much you might need, have a plan for how to pay for it. As things come up, keep the house under repair, do the things necessary to stay home. And finally, once you've figured all this out, celebrate after COVID-19. Well, even before COVID-19, but you can really celebrate after COVID-19 because you deserve it. If you've got, remember the point of these programs is to provide peace of mind uh, if you've got any questions regarding any of this, you can always contact uh, me or you can watch uh, our videos on our, own, or on, our, on our YouTube channel at Elder Law Frank and Mary. Uh, thank you very much for watching and uh, we'll look forward to talking to you next month. Thank you.